Good afternoon. Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Silibotti, the Tantex Professor of International and Development Economics at Yale University. Thank you, Fabrizio, for participating in the 42nd edition of the Barcelona School of Economics Lecture Series. I would also like to welcome Teresa Garcia Milá, Jaume Ventura, professors of the Barcelona School of Economics, and all of you students and members of the Academia in Barcelona, ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon here, here at Banco Sabadell. I'm really glad we are able to gather here again after two years of restrictions. In a moment, I will hand you over to Jauma, who will introduce Professor Silibotti. But first, let me say a few words to present the topic of today's lecture. The COVID crisis has been shaping the world economy and society of the past two years. Even now that we are beginning to leave behind the health emergency, we are still dealing with the economic aftermath of the crisis, especially in the form of inflation. Also, the COVID crisis has some structural implications. In this respect, some trends were already present before the crisis, and they have gained pace recently and are likely to play a central role in coming years. Digitalization is one of those trends with many implications in our lives and economies. Deglobalization is another one. And every new, new event just seems to move us more decisively in that direction. Also inequality. The COVID crisis has en engendered more inequality in many fields. In the labor market, for instance, unemployment was higher in lower income segments, whereas high income earners were less affected and were able to telework, which ultimately allowed them to accumulate more savings. Education is another field particularly impacted by COVID. The school closures during the pandemic have hurt stu students' learning skills, especially those in market market, emerging market economies. Within countries, the impact was also more severe for children from poorer families. If these shocks are not addressed, they will only perpetuate these asymmetries and create a vicious cycle in the years to come. So we need more than ever to pay attention to education. Today it's a privilege for us to gain further insight into Professor Silibotti's view. So thank you very much again, Fabrizio, for being here. And Jaume, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sofia. Um, I feel that um, I've been asked to introduce Fabrizio, and I think that Fabrizio needs no introduction here uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, first and most important one is that he spent uh, quite a few years uh, with us as a professor at Universitat Pompeu Fabra. Uh, the second one is that Fabrizio is one of the top macroeconomists of his cohort, and at least uh, we have all at some point seen and talked about one of his papers. Let me say, nonetheless say a few things, since I have not, I would not justify my presence here. And uh, the few things that I'm going to say is first that Fabrizio, after leaving Pompeu Fabra, which is where he came after his PhD at LSE, and where he, uh, where he learned how to do research by, by all. <laughs> anyway, uh, he moved into University College London, into Estocolm, into the University of Zurich, and finally he landed at Yale, where he has been for the last uh, few years, let's say. Uh, Fabrizio has been also a person that has, uh, it's a macroeconomist that is known by his creativity, uh, both uh, in the execution of his research, but also in the variety of very interesting topics he touches upon. I learned about him and I learned about his research uh, because he worked in the field of economic growth, which I was very interested a uh, few years back and I am still interested, and Fabrizio is still interested. And he wrote a number of papers uh, that were crucial in the field, like uh, papers on productivity differences, a paper on uh, was Prometheus unbound about uh, the effect of choices of technology uh, in the process of growth. Then he has started other lines of research. And in fact, he's been also choosing like eclectic topics once in a while. There's a beautiful paper of Fabrizio that I t 
teach to all my first year PhD. So all the students of the first year PhD that go through the University of Pompeu Fabra, uh, they have to work through all the equations of your paper on the survival of the welfare state. A very, very nice paper that actually shows how to do properly voting dynamics when people are foreseeing the future and are understanding that their votes today are going to affect the outcomes of votes tomorrow, which is a nice, very nice uh, technical achievement. Fabricio has gone on and worked on topics that have made him uh, quite popular. One for them is, for example, the analysis of Chinese growth. How come an economist that has uh, been working on theory decided at some point to roll off the sleeves and look at what happens at the main growth success of this period, which is China. And his paper, for example, Growing Like China, is one of the most cited and uh, best papers in applied macroeconomics of the last uh, 20 years or 20 or 15 years. In fact, it is for this that we ask him, uh, and we were very glad to have him uh, here present in our Barcelona Summer Forum, uh, a lecture about China that I still remember very fondly. Um, since then, he has moved on and has taken a new line of research, a lot of it with his uh, colleague, Matthias, well, not colleague in the sense of the same university, but his co-author, Matthias Dobke, about families, so how families uh, work, how parents educate their children, the role of altruism and all of that. In fact, it has uh, came up uh, a book uh, like three years ago, was three years ago, Fabrizio, or something like this about uh, this work on parenting, which I highly recommend. It's very entertaining, it's very full of messages, and so on. And today we are lucky that uh, Fabrizio has accepted to be here with us, and he will be presenting a kind of a pupurri of uh, papers uh, in this field to give us a view of uh, what his work is in this particular area. And he has entitled the lecture School Peers and Parenting Under the Shadow of COVID. So it's very timely in that respect as well. So without uh, further ado, I'm just going to thank uh, Fabrizio uh, for being here, for being, uh, uh, for giving us this lecture, and I would like you to welcome him with a very warm applause. So as I was saying, uh, let me start by thanking <coughs> the Barcelona School of Economics uh, and the Bank of Sabadell for, for uh, having me here. Uh, then Jaume did not make my task easier with saying all those uh, exaggerated uh, statements, but, uh, uh, but it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, especially so in a time in which in-presence lecture, you know, they are starting again, but for a while uh, I was talking about COVID under the shadow of COVID, meaning in my room and everyone being in her or his own room. Uh, so, you know, it's already uh, a great, uh, you know, event, uh, not that I am here, but that uh, uh, we can speak, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in real person. And so tonight or this evening, I would like to talk about the effect of COVID on inequality through a specific channel on which uh, I have been working uh, as Jaume was mentioning in, uh, uh, in the past uh, uh, few years. And uh, this is based on a number of papers. It will be a summary of results uh, uh, of work that I've done together uh, with Matthias Döpke, uh, the book that was mentioned, uh, but also with Francesca Agostinelli and, uh, and Giuseppe Sorrenti. So one of the motivation of uh, our research is that uh, Increasing inequality uh, is perceived as one of the major threats uh, that uh, Western uh, countries, Western economies face uh, after uh, you know, at least three decades over which we have seen inequality uh, growing in several dimensions. And uh, many people respond in different ways to that, that uh, somehow uh, uh, are threatening the cement of our societies. Now, uh, COVID has had a number of effects, and one of them that was mentioned in the introduction was uh, some people lost their job, and then governments have tried in, in a variety of ways to help people. But there is something that uh, 
uh, can have actually a longer term effect. So that comes through education and school. It comes through the channel of uh, you know, people having lost uh, uh, part of the uh, educational uh, uh, input and, uh, and this will have an effect on, on their ability to contribute to the uh, future of society, the future labor market, the future economy. In fact, uh, I want to start from this uh, quote uh, of Horace Mann, a great educational, uh, American educational reformer, who emphasized that uh, education is a, a crucial element of equalization of conditions in society. So not only it's uh, the way through which uh, we accumulate what we call the human capital and uh, make people more productive, uh, you know, better at uh, dealing with problems over time, but also we you know, through schools, uh, we reduce the inequality uh, where, you know, we open opportunity of people who are born in more uh, disadvantaged condition. Uh, the balance wheel of the social machinery, to use uh, uh, man's uh, work. Now, I am having some difficulty in, uh, is there a system through which I can perhaps Okay, now it works. So during COVID time, the great equalizer has been silenced for significant amount of time. Where? Well, essentially anywhere in the world with some differences across uh, countries, across uh, local communities and uh, in Spain, across states in the United States. But for, for a, a significant part of the time during which COVID has been most, uh, most virulent, uh, schools have remained at least partially closed. This is a map uh, I, I have taken from UNESCO. It's a very uh, rough uh, description of what happened because there is a lot of heterogeneity within countries. And so, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, some states closed the school, some states kept it open for longer periods. So it just gives an idea of uh, the extent of the problem and its heterogeneity. And if I focus for a moment on Europe, you see that there is also a large heterogeneity uh, where countries like uh, Italy or the Czech Republic or Poland kept their schools closed for longer period than uh, uh, Spain, and especially Switzerland that uh, almost didn't close their schools. But nevertheless, you know, I'm not going, I don't want to dwell on this type of heterogeneity. I want to say there was a long time during which this uh, 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 great equalizer uh, remained uh, quiet. Now, there is a literature that has studied, mostly an empirical literature, that has studied the effect of these uh, closures. First of all, it's a you know, an effect on a cohort. You know, the particular cohorts have been uh, hit by uh, the, the school closures. But there is also, there are also good reason to believe that these effects are largely uh, heterogeneous uh, across uh, the different parts of the society. Uh, for instance, uh, some people, some families uh, can provide their children with uh, uh, good access to computer, fast internet. Uh, I have received an enormous amount of requests, uh, which I have never satisfied to uh, uh, provide individual tuition to students who were, whose parents were willing to pay for having uh, specialized tutors. Uh, but for other children, there were no computers, uh, there's no fast internet, uh, there was perhaps one, one computer for the whole family and uh, you know, very different condition. <clears throat> parents also were uh, called to new roles and of course they were prepared to a different extent to these roles. Some of us are professional teachers. Uh, other parents uh, uh, have never uh, entertained an effort uh, uh, to, to, to substitute uh, teachers. So the level of education of parents uh, of course uh, also matters. Our, our research is uh, focusing on two dimensions that have remained more in the background of the studies I, I have seen. One is uh, the changes in the peer environment. Uh, so perhaps uh, stretching uh, 
Orasman's argument, I want to say that uh, the school is a social equalizer not only because uh, it, uh, it, it creates a common uh, uh, environment for learning, the, sa the same teacher is speaking to children coming from, from different backgrounds, but also because it becomes a place where children interact one with another, and we know that uh, those interactions are very important uh, for uh, the development of uh, personality and also for the cognitive side of that. Uh, the way parents interact with children has also changed and has also been import changed in a different way across different parts of society, not only for the, region, uh, the reasons that I already mentioned, but also uh, because you know, a number of other things happened that I want to talk about. Another element that uh, makes uh, uh, you know, what we do different from a number of uh, existing uh, studies, some of them are absolutely uh, important and fundamental, to, to be clear, is our attempt to foresee the effect of what, we, what is happening for the future society. So uh, we know that there has been some loss of uh, learning associated with the closure of schools. Uh, I think we, you know, without the help of economic theory, it's harder to tell how persistent these effects will be. Many children will still have some years ahead of them before finishing school, so they might be able to make up for what was lost. And so to what extent the effects are transitory or permanent, and especially so when these effects are unequal across uh, the society. So this is another reason why our approach is more based on theory, and it's based on theory and data, to be clear, than uh, uh, other studies that try to evaluate the impact effect of what we have seen. I want to start uh, my analysis by using some of the background knowledge from our previous work on these two topics, uh, parenting style and uh, peer environment. So the first, I, let me start from uh, uh, parenting style and what we call the economics of family and parenting. So uh, this is a topic that uh, one might think, you know, it has been studied for a long period by specialists in the area of education. Uh, psychologists, uh, sociologists, uh, historians uh, have, have studied uh, the, 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 the role and the effect of, uh, of parenting. I would say that relative to these other fields, economists, uh, or at least we, take a perspective of uh, 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 parenting as a choice. So parents make choices in our view, and those choices are made in a somehow conscious way. If you take a, a lot of the work, again, uh, uh, very useful and insightful that have, you know, in, in, the, in the child psychology literature, parents are often described as a set of characteristics. So you, know, you can be a parent, uh, so if you behave in a certain way, then your children will have a, a certain result that can be better or worse to you know, caricaturize a bit uh, the, 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 the approach. We think that uh, parenting can be better understood, or at least usefully understood, as the result of uh, choices, as we like to think as economists. So choices are made in order to fulfill some objectives. Firms uh, combine inputs, uh, try to innovate in order to improve their, uh, their, their technology and, and then to have higher profits. Parents want to achieve something else, and you know, one can say more noble, I don't know, which is they want to have happy children. They want them to be happy as children today and to be happy in future, where happiness has as one of its dimension, not the only one, the economic success. So when we think about economics of parenting, we don't necessarily think about the economics of making our children rich but rather making our children happy. Parents may have different views about uh, how important it is to have the happy child today or uh, how important it is to invest uh, in the future, but somehow most parents uh, have these goals and we think that this 
can be used uh, as a, uh, an assumption that is uh, valid uh, across different you know, times and different countries. Uh, parents respond to incentives. So in trying to achieve these goals, parents uh, respond to the type of incentives they face, be them economic or not. And so, you know, one of the little advantage I have is, uh, as, as uh, Jaume mentioned before, uh, I have been in many countries. And one thing that is surprisingly different, uh, uh, sometimes shockingly so, is how different parents reason and think in different places. In fact, my daughter was born in Scandinavia, in Sweden, uh, and I, I now live in the United States. My daughter is now grown up, so uh, it's a different uh, type of problem. But when I, see, when I see the parents of the American children, I see them uh, you know, very stressed about things that I, I had never uh, anything to be concerned about. So, uh, and, I th and we believe that you know, the type of society where parents uh, act affect the way they behave because what it means to have a, a happy and a successful child in one place is different from what it is in another. Parents are also subject to constraints. Constraints, well, their own education, you cannot, give to, you cannot uh, teach uh, certain things to your child if you don't know them. Uh, parents have time constraints. Financial constraints, uh, the people who write to me and offer me money to, 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 to give tuition to their children uh, have more money than uh, the poor people living in, uh, in the ghetto uh, of New Haven. Parents may have informational and cognitive constraints. This is not, it's not quarreling about whether people are more or less rational. So there might be cognitive biases and we might, this might be perfectly consistent with the way we look at the problem. But somehow, we want to think of a choice subject to constraint and subject to incentive, which means that in different em environments, parents behave in a different way. And we have used this framework in the book to study uh, changes over history, across social group, across country, uh, and uh, as inequality uh, grows over time. So for instance, uh, this is uh, one of the pictures from, from the book. Uh, it shows uh, something which is, of course, a, a correlation, uh, not a, without any pretense of uh, you know, econometric identification. It's a relationship between the extent of income inequality that we have in different countries and the type of values that parents regard as uh, most uh, appropriate to transmit to their children. If you take uh, Scandinavian countries, the most popular, this, this is taken from a list of uh, values, and let me cut the, the story short, but you see that uh, uh, about 70% of the parents regard values such as imagination and independence as cardinal, very important. Whereas those values are not regarded as so important in countries like China or the United States, and you see there is, a, there is an interesting uh, uh, correlation with the extent of uh, income inequality. If you think about values, a value like hard work, uh, which we associate with what we call authoritative and intensive parenting style, it's the other way around. Uh, Swedish parents uh, think that you should never stress your child. Uh, Chinese parents typically think you should stress your child as much as you can. And so, you know, this is an interesting picture. And it's also interesting that the same type of relation is observed when inequality changes over time within each country. So as inequality grows within a country, we observe that parents turn less permissive, more intensive. And for instance, if you take the United States and the Netherlands, parents are more intensive uh, in the you know, emphasizing hard work, let's say, in the United States and the Netherlands all the time. But if you, if you look at uh, how inequality has grown in the two countries, well, in the US it has grown more and parents have become even more intensive relative to the other. And this relationship holds, for instance, uh, we, in Spain there was a time in which uh, uh, between uh, the mid 1990s and the mid 2000s, inequality was uh, stagnant to declining and parents, if anything, becoming more permissive. These are just uh, some observations. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a pattern that we observe. So, you know, this is somehow hard to explain, 
through the uh, folk explanation, well, countries are different because there are different cultures. It's more than that. We see that there is a response in the way parents behave. Uh, and in fact, we also document that the same type of response is there for uh, return to education, uh, redistributive policy, the organization of the school system. And you know, in one of the rare moments, I show you something formal. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a set of uh, logic regression in which the dependent variable is an intensive parenting style, emphasizing hard work, again, to, to, keep, to, take it short, to keep it short. And you see that in the first two columns, I have the, uh, co the, the um, odds ratio from the logit uh, regression uh, for the regression on inequality uh, using pooling all the observation. We have several uh, uh, you know, years from the, from the world value survey, and we find that uh, higher inequality tends to be associated with a higher intensity in uh, parenting style. Uh, but if we control for fixed effect, the, 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 co the estimated coefficient is about the same. So it seems that the same relationship holds within countries. And also, you can see that uh, uh, there is an independent effect uh, of uh, uh, policies like tax progressivity and, and social expenditure. OK, so to, for the rest of today, I don't want to talk about uh, uh, this level of diversity of parenting style. But I want to emphasize that we think of uh, COVID as a change in the environment. And that change in the environment producing some response partly from the peer, to which I turn now, and partly from the parents. So bearing this in mind, let me go to the other building block of the story, which is the peer environment. So this comes from a study that uh, we have uh, uh, constructed uh, and realized uh, after the book with uh, uh, the four co-authors, the three co-authors I mentioned. So what do we know about uh, peer effects? Well, uh, let me focus on a couple of essential findings that are relevant for what I want to talk today about COVID. The, the, the main fact is that hanging out with school proficient children tends to be associated with an improvement in a child's learning and school performance. It's, it's in our data, but our data is observational. So you can, you know, we're going to estimate a model. It's a part of our finding. But it's also the, the wisdom that comes from a, a, a larger literature. Let me mention, for instance, uh, this relatively recent paper by List, Momeni, and Zenu, which is interesting because uh, it's experimental. So they uh, estimate the effect of a randomized large-scale early childhood intervention on the educational attainment of uh, uh, over 2,000 disadvantaged children in South Chicago. So the first uh, set of results that uh, uh, some of these authors, uh, John List in particular, had found was that, well, the, result, the, the effects of this intervention, which were of various type, mostly of, of support to parents in, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in helping the, 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 the child development of their children. But they were positive but small, these effects, until when you know, they realized that just looking at uh, uh, treatment and control group was not uh, 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 an ideal strategy because there are important spillover effects. So in fact, being close to a treated child has a positive effect on a non-treated child. So when you go and look at the children, it looks like the effects are not, are not very big. They are pretty small. So once they model the spillover as a, you know, as a matter of distance between children and other peers that have been treated, they find that, the, that this, uh, 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 the effect of this intervention is, in fact, very large. And a lot of, it, a lot of that effect comes through the social network of the children. So understanding the role of social network of children is, is important. And again, I'm emphasizing this because during COVID, one aspect is that the social networks of children get disrupted. Now, one thing that we want to know in order to build our model uh, is how ch uh, children form their friendships. So on this, we have a structural model where we estimate 
uh, the determinant of the probability that children make ties one to another. And I'll, I'll tell you a moment what the data, what data we use, but uh, I want to start from the result. So the probability of forming friendships depends on the similarity across children, similarity in many dimensions, also in uh, school proficiency dimension. That's what the literature call homophily. It's much more likely that if you put together a group of children, uh, children of the same academic uh, proficiency, they tend to hang together and form friendship. Parents' approval turns out a bit to my surprise when I started this project to be also very important. So parents can intervene, and we're talking about adolescent here, adolescents here, and uh, uh, affect the probability that certain friendships are formed. But before continuing, let me tell you the type of data we have. This is a study before COVID, but our strategy will be to put together all we have learned before COVID and then think of a change in the conditions and in the environment and then see what we can expect. So this is a, this is a data set which is other people have used before us. It's called the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. Uh, so these are children that start uh, all over their high school, adolescents. It's, uh, it focuses on 144 public and private schools that are representative for the US. And it has a large number of respondents, over 90,000. Now, this data set is unique in the following. Unfortunately, it's a bit old by now because it goes back to the, to the 1990s. But uh, you know, uh, the hope is that uh, uh, something similar will be updated uh, uh, at some point soon. So we have information about the friendship network within school. So we literally know when a child declare another child to be the friend, a friend of him or her, and when this is reciprocated. And we take you know, that situation of reciprocity as evidence of a childhood being formed. And that's you know, something we use for modeling this process of uh, uh, matching and formation of, of, of friendship. We know the uh, core subject grades and other measure of cognitive uh, uh, learning. Uh, we also know how much time parents spend with their children. And finally, we have other information on the parenting style. And in particular, and in particular, we are interested in the following question that pertains to interaction between parenting style and peers. The question is, do your parents let you make your own decisions about the people you hang around with? Children can simply answer no or yes. The majority of parents don't interfere in the process, in, in the process of, of uh, friend formation, but 16% do. So this is a dimension of what we call uh, authoritarian parenting. Let's not worry too much about the labeling, but let's remember for, 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 uh, for uh, uh, reference this term. So it's a minority of parents, but it's also very diverse across social environment. This graph uh, shows on the horizontal axis the median family income at school. So the further to the right, the richer the school environment is. This is a bean scatter plot. So it's not one observation per dot. The dot is a summary of uh, uh, you know, observation with those characteristics. And what you can see, and on the vertical, you have the fraction of authoritarian parents. So the authoritarian parents are prominently in, the, uh, in poorer neighborhoods, in poorer schools, and in unequal neighborhoods. So where parents behave in an authoritarian way is where there are many uh, uh, children from poor families and where there is a lot of inequality. Here we measure the inequality in terms of grade. If we measure it in terms of income, it's essentially uh, the same. So it's suggestive of the fact that when parents see a potentially dangerous environment from their point of view, they try to interfere with the process of uh, uh, friendship formation. We also find that this intervention has effects on the uh, quality of the relationship between parents and children, which in turn has an effect on the 
learning ability. So it spills over to the, to the uh, um, accumulation of, to, to the cognitive skill of the children, to the progress of children to school. And we interpret this as, you know, the, if, you, if you try to, uh, you know, confront your child and say, don't go out with this, don't go out with that, to some extent, what the data suggests, to some extent you succeed, but you ruin the relationship and the harmony in the family. So we see two things. On the one hand, a deterioration of the uh, uh, you know, school outcomes, conditional on, on, on other things, including peer selection. But we see an improvement in peer selection. So this looks very much like a trade-off, which is what uh, we economists get uh, uh, often uh, interested in. So even when we look at this type of authoritarian intervention, and you know, if you just look at the raw data, it looks as this is not a good idea because on average, an authoritarian parenting style is associated with uh, worse outcomes. Well, it's true, but it improves the peer selection. And once you look at that channel, you realize that it's actually possible to rationalize this type of behavior. So you know, once again, it's suggestive of the fact that parents respond with the best of their intention that somehow, you know, it could also be that uh, uh, a more sophisticated parent, remember, only 16% of, pa of parents have that type of behavior, but uh, uh, parents uh, uh, respond in, in some way in what they perceive to be at least the best way to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, deal with that problem. Of course, parents also do more, and parents uh, spend time in supporting uh, the learning and the motivating children, and we have information about that. So parents make investment, and the investments vary across the socioeconomic ladder and as a function of uh, the peer environment. Changing the peer environment and changing the school environment is going to trigger, according to what we have learned from our previous studies, changes in the behavior of parents. OK, so after this. Uh, uh, long uh, pre-COVID uh, uh, discussion. I want you to think you know, through the lens of what I've said, of COVID as a shock, they affect everybody's uh, environment, but not in the same way. And I'm going to describe exactly step by step how we think COVID has changed the condition for interaction between children and for interaction between parents and children. And of course, taking into account the direct effect of the school closures. Ultimately, we want to give some, put some numbers to the effect of this uh, uh, and you know, how much of an increase in inequality that can generate today and in uh, five years down the road. So the approach I'm going to take and this is based on a paper that was recently uh, published in the Journal of Public Economics uh, last January, is the following. First, we estimate a model using pre-COVID data. Second, we make plausible evidence-based assumptions. What, what I mean is that I, I used what I know from the empirical studies that have by now been produced to, to discipline those assumptions, but I want to make assumptions about changes in the environment the school closures imply. And then I can use the model, well, first to replicate those features, but more importantly, once I have a model I can trust, I can simulate that model, I can generate, uh, I, can, I can tell you what, if my model is right, what we should expect to happen uh, five years down the road. And also, uh, that could be used as guidance for policy, because you know, I can also think about interventions of different type that can modify the situation. The building blocks of the theory are three. The first is a model of, uh, is, a, is a skill formation technology. So skill formation technology is something we borrow from the work of uh, uh, Jim Hackman, Flavio Cunha, and others. Uh, so these people postulate that the process of knowledge accumulation is a dynamic cumulative process which depends on uh, a number of inputs. So children start 
And you know, today, unfortunately, I will only speak about uh, cognitive skills. We know that non-cognitive skills are as important, perhaps more important, and I think you know, that would be very interesting to, to, to explore that. With my data, I cannot do much on that. So anyway, think of a child entering with some uh, level of cognition, the first grade in high school, and then every year that cognition increases as a function, well, of the initial level of cognition, of the input of the school, of the peer effects, and of the support and the type of support that each child receives at home. That's the first, uh, the first building block of my analysis. The second is a model of friendship formation. I will not elaborate on that. It has the characteristics that I have discussed before. And the third is a choice of parents. So parents do their intervention, and their intervention can be spending time and resources with their children uh, can also be to try to influence the process of uh, peer formation. So let me focus particularly, in particular, on the uh, uh, skill formation technology, because the other two parts I, I, have, already, uh, I have already said uh, about. So the process of skill formation, think about the common notion of a production function. So in production function, firms use capital and labor to produce goods in order to maximize profits. Here, the output are not goods, but it's a level of cognition. And the inputs are what I said before, you know, the, sc the school, the, the uh, uh, relationship with other children, the interventions of, of parents. So we, we, we postulate a certain technology that I'll, I'll show you in a moment, and then we estimate the parameters to gauge the quantitative effect of each of the factors. Once again, this is done before COVID. So one criticism you can hold against me is, well, COVID changes the entire nature of the technology in a, in a more fundamental way than your technology captures. But here is how it looks. So think of this theta i t plus 1 as the level of cognition of a child, child i, at time t plus 1. And a t is what in uh, production technology we call the total factor productivity. So it's uh, how much everything is productive. If you want, it's related to the input of the school and other things that enter in a neutral way. Then inside that, that bracket, you have an aggregate of three inputs that, you know, the aggregation is done through a nested uh, 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 CES function. So it's a function featuring constant series of substitution nested in a particular way. Uh, I don't want to, to, to become technical, but I, I there are, look at the three inputs. One is the current stock of skill. So theta it here is the, the, the stock of skill with which the child enters at time t. And the other is the, uh, the effect of the peer, which is measured by a statistics that you can think of the average quality of the peers. We, can, we have tried alternative specification, but this is the, the easiest uh, to communicate quickly. And the last one is the investment that parents make in terms of uh, time. And then there are a lot of parameters there. How do we estimate so many parameters? Well, we have many data, and we can run a lot of uh, reduced form regressions. And this method is called indirect inference. We are going to, uh, to uh, infer those parameters as those that provide a best fit to uh, that set of regressions. Again, for the details, I have to refer you to. Uh, to the paper. But let me tell you a fundamental element of uh, what we do. We think of authoritarian parenting style as something that changes the entire nature of that production function. So P here stands for parenting style. So when a parent behaves in an authoritarian or non-authoritarian ways, we we allow, we give the maximum flexibility to that technology to allow all the relationship between the different inputs to change. Why? Well, because for instance, we think that the extent to which once you have uh, behaved in that way, 
you can then interact positively with the child and support the learning can be affected by that. Uh, but let me give you the, <coughs> the simplest uh, uh, of the insights. The total factor productivity falls. It's actually something we estimate. So if you, if you behave in an authoritarian way, the entire productivity of the learning technology falls uh, as a result. The thing that goes better is the process of peer selection. So the term uh, that captures that, it's uh, going to be better over time. OK, so when we estimate this production function, we have the following insights that I'm trying to summarize in a, in a you know, informal way without telling you the numbers of those parameters. First of all, for parents who behave in a non-authoritarian way, which are the majority, they tend to spend more time when, with their children when the peer environment is bad. So they tend to substitute for a poor peer environment. And they tend to spend more time when their own child is proficient. So the data suggests that there is some type of complementarity between the investment of children and the school proficiency of the child. There is, you know, if you want, some element of giving up when the child doesn't really make progress. And for authoritarian parenting, I have already said, it has this negative effect overall on school performance, a positive effect through the process of friends uh, selection. It also creates a barrier towards other children who are in worse situation because the authoritarian parenting styles he introduces, uh, how the way we estimate, a penalty towards liaising for children who try to liaise, who would liaise with other children that parents don't like because they have a low uh, school performance. So this becomes a barrier, a penalty. If you go with those children, you will suffer some, some loss in, in utility that induces then the child as a consequence to stay away from those to some extent. Not, uh, you know, it's not uh, always successful as we, you know, we probably know. But it's not completely unsuccessful. It's actually uh, uh, active. OK, so what changes in the environment during pandemic time? First of all, there is a fall in the productivity of the skill formation technology. The term they call A, we allow that to fall in order to match the average loss of uh, cognitive learning that we observe in the data. So that's the first exogenous change that we introduce. But there is more. There is a change in the peer environment. We focus on two aspects of that. The first is growing socioeconomic segregation, and the second is the psychological effect of the loss of an in-person contact with friends. Let me, let me tell you what the data say about each of those. So this is a figure that is based, again, on the, on the data set we have. This is pre-COVID. But uh, on the horizontals, you have the median family income at the census block level. And then in, in each, uh, fix, for instance, your, your view on the 20,000 level. There is a, a red dot and a blue dot. The blue dot is the average GPA, so the average school grade, that the children your child interacts with have if the, the basing of interaction, if the area where interaction takes place is the school. The red is the same statistics if instead of interacting with children in the school, your child interacts with children in the block. The assumption we make, and here you know, we are in the world of informed guesses because we don't have you know, a strong guidance, is that I mean, we have some, some pieces of evidence, actually, about that. But, but the uh, children start, the interactions children have start being more local. Here we are in the United States, where distances are bigger than in Spain. It could be that in Spain, this effect is, is less significant. It's also, uh, you know, somehow more uh, residential segregation there. But what you see is that for, poor ch for, for children of poor family, restricting the interaction at the block level means to have a worse peer group than when you were going to school. Conversely, look at the 80,000 level. For those kids, while well, restricting the interaction to the block level means to, to be more together with other children that are as rich as your family is. 
So there is a process of further segregation. Schools in the United States are horribly segregated for European standards. But blocks are even more segregated, almost by construction, I would say. So this would also be true in other countries. I don't know if by to the same extent or to a lesser extent. So that's the change in the peer environment we have. You see, the, the, the blue and the red line are the, gra the, the socioeconomic gradient in the quality of the peer environment when the, the interaction happens at the school level and when, supposedly under COVID, this happens at the, at the block level. So think that the world becomes more segregated. The other thing is something we noticed and uh, we, we were, we find it interesting. I, I'm not sure if it has been noticed before. There is an effect in the data, again, pre-COVID data, well, when some children leave the sample, because those children are entire, all, all the group is sampled, we, we think that in most cases, these are parents who, who went, uh, families that left the, the school. So what do we see after a child has left school for those who stay? We see a significant negative effect on the school performance of stayer. And it's not a statistical, uh, <laughs> You, you can think of statistical reason why it's that, and we have taken care of those. So it's really that these children do worse. Everybody the same? No. Those who start with being school proficient, I'm sure they are also sad to lose some of their best friends, but they don't. That doesn't translate into a loss in uh, cognition. But for the children who are already not doing so well, there is a strong effect, negative effect. That's something we see in the data. And so we interpret the, the COVID as having some effect of this type. And we, we assume that it's, because you know, during COVID children still have relationships through social media, et cetera. But you know, this happens with many children. We take the approximation and here it's, it needs some faith that it's as if they lost for good one, uh, the contacts with one friend. Well, then it comes to parents for parents there are, so the changes of environment for children, those I described, changes of environment for the parents, new demands on their time imposed by the need of replacing teachers. I have already spoken about that. But that is subject to differential constraints. Not only because some parents are, are teachers and some are not, but also because of the flexibility of the labor arrangement. So across profession and income levels, these are very different. And let me show you two graphs. The first tells you how much time, this, this is from time use service, and the first tells you how much time uh, parents spend with their children in uh, school enhancing activities without giving you all the details about how we classify those. So, and then we see during COVID, the average time of contact goes up by a factor of four. Not a surprise, right? Children are at home all the time uh, and need, need help. Parents are there. But the other thing that is less uh, nice to note is that the income gradient is, becomes much steeper. What does it mean? It means that if even before COVID, the wealthier parents, the more you know, um, affluent families were spending more time with their children in the United States, but I believe uh, uh, that would be true in, 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 in other countries too, at least in, in other countries I've seen as a case. Well, during COVID, that relationship become much steeper. That means that parents from affluent families respond by dedicating much more time, disproportionately more relative to less affluent families. And that's another source of inequality. Why is that? Actually, our model would have ambiguous prediction if they could choose without any constraint. But there are constraints. These constraints are given by the differential ability of parents from richer and poorer family to telecommute. Uh, you know, excellent paper by uh, a set of uh, um, scholars, including you know, the, first, uh, the first author being Adam Prassel, documents for several countries. Here I report Germany because uh, there are other, in some countries there are pages and pages of, uh, of categories. But you can see that the percentage of tasks that are possible from home are very much socially segregated. Auxiliary craftsmen and 
and craft women, service and retail. These are typically low education profession. And those people during COVID, they had very little chance to telecommute. To the opposite, uh, you know, people in management, office administration, academics, technicians, they could uh, stay 50 to 60 percent of the, they could perform 50 to 60 percent of their task from home. So we introduced this as a differential time constraint into the model. And then we also take into account the responses of parents to changes in the peer environment, the fact that in, in some places uh, the peer environment become worse and that we know that parents tend to become more authoritarian. Let me show you the results. So again, this is a model that has different bits. It's estimated on pre-COVID data. Then we change some of the conditions that happen during COVID. And those changes are disciplined from what we know in the data. For instance, we replicate the average loss of learning that has been estimated in, the in some studies. I believe that what we do is lower bound to the real effects, because other studies that came up later showed larger effects, not smaller ones. So suppose that there is a one-year shutdown of school. This is the immediate effect of that shutdown presented in the following way. On the horizontal, I have census block family income. So I'm showing you from the poor to the rich. And on the vertical, I have the percentage change in learning in GPA after one year. To give you an idea, uh, first in a more technical sense, for the lowest uh, quintile, so at 20%, there is a decrease of 0 0.4 standard deviation in, in grades which corresponds to a loss of 40%. But let me give you a more understandable metric, at least more understandable if you know the American system. OK, the first thing I want to notice before giving you the, that metric is the remarkable difference between rich children from rich and from poor families. The children for the poorer families suffer a large loss in cognitive learning. The children from the richest family do not suffer. Actually, the partial evidence we have is very much consistent with that. If anything, some studies point at a, a larger difference between than the one we find here. Uh, what, it, what does it mean uh, translated in grade? Well, for those of you familiar with the US grading system, every country, unfortunately, is a different one. Uh, for the Top from the, from the uh, uh, bottom 20%, it's like the child going from straight Bs to getting C in half of the subject. And for the even lower, of course, it's even larger at the fact. So these are very large loss or losses of cognition that are specific to the children that come in the lower part in the lower end of the income distribution and are not shared by the uh, richer kids here. Now, our model allows us to tell, to say, what happens if, well, after one year, the school starts again. The great equalizer starts working again. Let me take the case of a child that is hit in first uh, grade in high school, which in, would be in the ninth grade in the, in the US system. So there's still. Uh, 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 four years to make up for that loss. Those years, of course, they, they reduce that impact effect. But that effect doesn't go away. In fact, half of that stays. So half of the inequality generated by COVID, according to, the, to our estimated model, that again, in pre-COVID -ti pre times, does pretty well at replicating the typical evolution of the uh, uh, cognition for children. Well, our estimates suggest that half of that effect uh, is still there. Note that things get slightly worse uh, over time for the richer children. Why is that? Well, intuitively, some of the children that come from lower background, they mix with them in schools. Now the peer effect is a bit worse. And you can think also about the effect of this 
in the speed at which teaching goes, which is not explicit in the model. But anyway, you see that there is less inequality at the end of the cycle. Even then, that corresponds to a, that, that amounts to a loss of income of uh, about 25% on the end. So again, in, in expectation, 25% on the entry salary for the poorest kids, and essentially no effect for the richest one. That's a large effect. So 50% of the gap uh, does persist. So what explains this? Actually. All the three uh, candidates are important. The shutdown of school, it's important on average. So if we hadn't had that, that uh, effect on the productivity, so if, if remote learning, at least on average, was as good as uh, in-person learning, the average effect would be significantly smaller. But when it comes to the unequal effect, the change in the peer environment, it's really important. The change in the peer environment happens up on impact. So this is the, what happens in the year of COVID. Children not only don't go to school and don't have the chance of uh, learning in school, but they also interact much more with children that have a lower GPA relative to the, to the standard situation in which they go to, to school. So you see that that zero, would correspond to the situation when children go to a normal school year, whereas you see what happens in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, as a result of COVID in a differential sense. And the other <coughs> important effect is the childcare time during COVID. And the fact that the response of parents is so skewed in a way in favor of uh, those parents coming from uh, uh, the richer, uh, the richer uh, socioeconomic, uh, the high socioeconomic environment. There is also something which is in the in the model, which I haven't explained in detail. But there is some type of legacy effect. So it's not only in the year of uh, uh, COVID that parenting and peer interactions are affected. Uh, they, for instance, the the uh, the peer effects continue to be bad after COVID because the low neighborhood tends to be, the, the, the low income neighborhood tend to be more affected. Parents tend to be more authoritarian in those places because now they are scared about the, the, the situation, the new peer situation that has materialized. And as a result, those children who have the largest difficulty perceive even more difficulty in, in catching up. So in terms of uh, what of these different factors matter the most, well, for the average effect, the direct impact of school closure is the lion's share of the explanation, even though peer effects accounts for as much as 31% of the total effect. So it's certainly important, and even parental time does. But when you look at the, at the, at the uh, socioeconomic gradient, its uh, peer effects are really important. So if you believe the estimates of peer effect that we have from earlier studies, and you think that the assumptions we have made about the change in the peer environment are relevant. Well, you know, something that I didn't say, we have some data about the time children spend interacting with other children. Not surprise, it plunged during COVID. They tend also to interact with significantly fewer children. It's likely that those children are those living in the immediate neighborhood or even in the family. So, 60, so if we hold peer influences on learning constant at the pre-crisis level, the gradient is reduced by 62%. I want to uh, go uh, towards the conclusion by uh, speaking about a couple of policy implications. The first is we should be aware that these, the impact effects of uh, COVID on uh, educational inequality are hard to undo and have lifelong consequences on children's future prospects. So let's not make ourselves illusions. They are going to uh, stay there. In fact, we, we propose in the in study a number of potential interventions. It's very hard to make them go away completely. However, there are, of course, policies that can mitigate the problem. The first that, you know, was mostly relevant. This was when we wrote this, we were in, in, still in the, in the, in the, in the uh, 
mid, mid, middle of the COVID crisis. I, I hope we don't, it doesn't become again relevant this fall. I, I hope not. Uh, well, provision of uh, free targeted ch child care uh, would uh, uh, certainly be something, something useful. Um, again, taking into account that some groups uh, are less capable of substitute for uh, the, the role of, of parents, of, of, of teachers, sorry. Uh, well, something we have been advocating with, with mixed success, and you can guess why, is to shorten, in some systems at least, certainly my country, Italy, has a huge summer. Now, in summer, the teachers tell me it's hot, and I know. But this is a different, this time is different, you know, and uh, the, if I think about the uh, healthcare personnel, uh, they have suffered, they take an, an immediate, an, an enormous cost for what is happening, so perhaps uh, for one year, one could make some extra sacrifice. If that's not possible, or, you know, as an additional type of instrument, we have evidence that targeted support to disadvantaged groups, uh, mostly I know evidence from the US, but they are in, you know, very effective. So pr the provision of camps during summer for children who lag behind in areas where uh, you know, there are more disadvantaged children, the, the studies show that they are quite effective. So this long period of, of uh, absence from school is as, as a very large consequences on, on the uh, uh, learning of, of all children. Those who are already behind, for them it's of course especially bad, but if you do <clears throat> some weeks of, uh, of tuition in, in summer, well, first of all, many children attend, and second, the evidence is actually quite encouraging. Another thing is we should expect inequality to increase more where there is more residential inequality, so perhaps the results would be less dramatic in a country like Spain, where overall there is less residential segregation. Uh, or in the United States, there would be difference between cities and rural areas. Cities are more unequal in the United States than uh, uh, you know, less urbanized areas. So probably those are the areas where you want to uh, focus more the intervention. Uh, you know, the last point is, uh, is a politically delicate one, because on the one hand, we want to make sure that people uh, enter and go back to the labor force, and we don't want to create some culture of dependence uh, uh, of, uh, on subsidies. And so there's been a lot of discussion in, in, in the US about this, and I know also in Spain. Now, uh, that said, awareness of the fact that some groups may need uh, support for spending time with their children and help their children can be a useful part of the story. So if a targeted uh, exemption has to have, have to be made, well, this paper provides an argument for that. Uh, of course, in a situation in which, uh, I repeat, I think that it's important to, to take uh, uh, the population back to work. And, and this was actually my last slide. So I would like to thank you for uh, the attention and uh, uh, again, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Fabrizio, for such an uh, inspiring presentation. And I would like to ask now the floor if you have questions. Now it's the time to go through it, Jordi. The, no, no, you'll get the, the mic. In the yeah, so thanks very much. So it's, it's very interesting how all this fits together, how you construct all this. Now, uh, I mean, there are several elements which are kind of very standard, but then you have this parenting style which is something I hadn't seen before in, in this kind of thing. And I guess my question is, once you get to the results, uh, can you say a bit more about what happens to parenting styles? Do they change? Are they now different? And uh, if they change, is this, uh, is this actually rational? Are this uh, adaptive? In which way does it go? And, and, and that's, that's my question. Yes, uh, th thank you, Jordi. I I, I went a little uh, fast at the end because I thought I was uh, over time. But indeed, we observe uh, an increase in the percentage of parents uh, who turn uh, authoritarian. This is, I want to be clear, this is a prediction of the model. We don't have direct data that will say, oh, that's what we have seen. Let's say 
the model in this case would say that the in, in, in response to this change in the peer environment and in the old condition set, we would see a selective uh, increase in the percentage of parents who turn authoritarian. The order of magnitude you, you see is there. Remember, the average percentage is 16%. 16% of parents are authoritarian. And here, although for the poorer parent is higher than that, the increase is up to something like 15%. So it's quantitatively a sizable thing. And moreover, the model has a mechanism by which this is going to persist to some extent over time. Again, everything that makes the situation in those poor neighborhood more problematic, it's going to induce more of a defensive response of the poor, uh, you know, families. Uh, you know, in the model, there is a, some type of idiosyncratic shocks. Uh, it's a random utility, which makes, you know, some parents may are more prone to be authoritarian than other, but as the conditions change, the threshold around that uh, random utility model changes and in the direction that you see there. So. That effect has two, this has two effects. The first, well, there is a loss of total factor productivity, which is, uh, you know, inefficient. It's not irrational because those parents, uh, uh, you know, indeed their children are in a worse peer environment. So individually, it's a rational response. In our model, it's always like that. Again, we can discuss that in further detail. But uh, collectively, it's bad because it generates a negative externality. So for us, it's a way of trying to shelter your child from those who are, uh, you know, school uh, uh, non-proficient, which of course in, in reality is associated with other phenomena. No, it's not only they take low, they get their nice children, they get low grades, the typical have other manifestation of problems. But that's what happens is, you know, parents become more defensive and that reduces further on average the catch up of the of the poor people. Um, Fabricio, so thank you for the lecture. I think it confirms what many of us suspect that these school closures were a disaster. Now here you take it as a, basically as given and then you were thinking about policy towards the end. But the closure itself was a policy choice uh, to begin with, and it was very different across places, as you pointed out at the beginning. So here in Spain, I, maybe mistakes were made at the beginning of the pandemic, but at least schools reopened fairly quickly. Other places where the pandemic was not as severe, I would say, schools remained closed for, for a long time. So do we have an understanding of what drove these uh, heterogeneity in policy choices? Is it, uh, you know, uh, from a political economy perspective, is it teachers' unions? What, what drove this, being that it was such a costly uh, choice, let's say? Thank you. Yes, I, it's, it, it's a very good question. I don't think we have a complete understanding, and I think there is a lot of uh, that variation that was given, you know, why Switzerland did not close its schools. They decided like that, I cannot give you a, a rationalization. But I think that, you know, my experience from having been part of, active part of this debate is unions played an important role. So I received uh, <laughs> our study, and I think it uh, was the last of its uh, intention, received a lot of publicity among uh, uh, circles, uh, you know, among in, in some uh, Republican legislature, as you know, in the United States on this topic, the Republicans were more for opening and Democrats were, especially where unions had a role and uh, were more for closing it. And somehow, it, at some point, I had even to defend myself by saying, wait a second, we have nothing to say here about, uh, you know, you should never close the school. At some point, it's a matter of trade-off. But I think that it's important to understand how costly it is to, to, to keep uh, schools closed. And what I found especially disappointing is that, well, uh, if we keep the schools closed uh, for a month in uh, March, would it really so, be so crazy to say that we just postpone the calendar instead of uh, com completely renounce to that, uh, that month of education. I have not received much uh, uh, sympathy from, uh, uh, from, the, from the unions, uh, 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 both in the United States uh, and uh, uh, in Italy, where I, I, I try to voice that proposal. Uh, yes, first, uh, 
I want to add to, to what Alberto has said. Uh, you have to take into account that closing everything for a few months has a clear benefit in terms of health. Uh, so, and this model doesn't account for this, uh, this uh, let's say, general equilibrium factor. Uh, I, have, uh, I have to say this first. And second, I want to to ask a more technical question, if you allow me. From your talk, I infer that parental style was quite uh, endogenous to, to, to peers. To, to peers. Does those, your model account for this factor? I didn't uh, get from, from the talk that you, in, the, in your empirical analysis through this. And a second short question, what about gender? There are clear gender differences in the impact of COVID. Are you considering this in, in any far extension of your model? Thank you. Yes, thank you. So endogeneity, yes. We, uh, again, I, di I decided uh, not to, to give a, you know, equation-based presentation. So that's, you know, and then you suffer from sometimes not transmitting. But uh, everything. But the, the last graph that I, I have uh, uh, presented here is entirely the endogenous response of parenting style to the change in the peer environment. So that element is present, and it has also a quantitative sizable role. Uh, uh, I have, we haven't studied uh, gender inequality here. My co-author, Matthias Dupke, has a uh, you know, uh, highly cited uh, paper with uh, Michelle Tertilt and, and other co-authors, uh, I apologize because I don't remember them all, the name of all of them, but uh, they, they, uh, they study, uh, you know, the, the issue of uh, uh, how COVID impacts on, uh, specifically on gender inequality through, through different channels, and they conclude that, uh, uh, they, that this can also be an important issue. Uh, we we try to see uh, some gender, uh, gender heterogeneity aspect within the type of things we do. We didn't find anything that struck us as strong enough to introduce that. You know, the cost when you do this type of structural analysis is that uh, uh, bringing in too many layers of heterogeneity is costly uh, computation. And you know, the advantage of the, the empirical studies, I have already spoken about the advantage of my approach, but the advantage of there is that you can really condition on, on many things. I, I can say that, um, yeah, I, 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 I have read that um, boys tend to have more of an effect than girls. There, there was not so salient in our data, and again, we didn't consider in the end, but it's certainly important. So. I'm wondering about the, like the endogenous response of the educational system to the fact you're going to have this cohort. Right. That I, and I guess from personal experience, not as a father, because I don't have kids, but as a professor that you see these kids that might be entering with not with the knowledge, so that may reduce the quality, and that may have persistent effects. So I don't know if there's something in the past data pre-COVID that could allow us to predict what would be the effect of this lowering the standards and maybe having a longer impact from the educational perspective? So, uh, it's a very good question. My, in my production function, uh, the skill formation technology, this only comes through the uh, cognition of each child at time t. So, there is a, that could, so, end the spillover through the peer effects. So, it's not that, there is no, no such thing. But you could think that even what I treat as total factor productivity is impacted in a persistent way. So if somehow we were worried of being more on the, cons the air more on the conservative side than on the other one. And so we assume that the total factor productivity after one year returns to the original level. But what you say, and, and again, we have to start thinking about W the, the part of what you say that would already be captured by, by the inputs and the part that would, you know, somehow, I would say if the school is unprepared to this situation and reacts in a kind of inefficient way, uh, that would be a, a persistent effect on TFP. If instead it's only that they have uh, less proficient uh, kids, that's taken into account in a, in a way in what I, what I do. 
because it's not a productivity, it's just that you know, the input is of lower quality to start with. I'm, I'm sorry for using this terminology. In the US, I wouldn't do it, but. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, thanks a lot. I, I, had, uh, I wanted to, s um, to just to ask if you thought of extending the model to consider an, the effect of siblings in the, in the family, because it's clearly the, uh, both the interaction with peers if in a closed environment and the type of parental reaction may be very different depending on the number of kids, and that also is correlated with, in many countries, with socioeconomic status. So that can be like another potential mechanism. And I would agree. The, um, I don't think with the ad health data we can make much progress there, because you know this is just a sample, and perhaps we know if there are siblings, but it's not that we know what happens to the to the sibling because it will pre probably be in a different place or well, some of them may be in the different in the same school. And, uh, but you know, we know from other studies what uh, uh, those effects are. So I guess it would be a matter of uh, uh, you know here we have tried to stick to a single data set, but th th there is no reason why one shouldn't uh, try to extrapolate further information from from other data. And I I would agree. So. Uh, especially now that we assume that the, the, uh, the contacts are more local, looking at the other people directly inside the family, not only at the level of income of the family, could be very, very useful. So if you have a very bright uh, sibling, that could, could help. So that's definitely an interesting follow-up. Very well. As we have seen, this has been a, a very interesting presentation and uh, that elicited a lot of uh, questions. Um, I just want to conclude uh, the session by thanking uh, the Bank de Sabadell for hosting us, uh, the Barcelona School of Economics for organizing, and above everything, thanking Fabrizio for this uh, very illuminating lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.